Have something good to say? Say it well. Read your audience. Here's the fourth step to good communication. Intensity. The spirit and power and emotion with which you translate your communication. Intensity gives power to vocabulary. Words are just words, but here's what's powerful. Words loaded with emotion. See, that's what's powerful. You say, is the word powerful? Yes, the the word's powerful, but the emotion is so much more powerful. It's different reading the word bastard in the dictionary and have somebody call you one. If a word is a word, say no. A word just isn't a word. It all depends, right? It depends. Depends. So, emotion is like, if I took a little straight pin, right? Guy buys a shirt. It's got all these pins in it, right? You got to take out all these pins. If I took one of these little straight pins and I threw it at you, and it hit you in the face or the hands, you'd feel it, this little straight pin. But what if I took that little straight pin and wired it to the end of an iron bar about this long. See, and I let you have it with that, I could drive the pin through your heart. So the little pin is the words, and the iron bar is the emotions that give the words power, that gives the words weight, that makes it strike the consciousness. The day the Christian church was started, it said this unique sermon was preached, and the sermon was so powerful, it said, it struck their conscience. It struck their consciousness. And your words can become so powerful it can strike somebody's consciousness and they say, oh, wow, now I know what I did wrong. Now I understand the difficulty. Now I can see. And words can become that powerful that they strike the heart. They strike the mind. They strike the consciousness so that somebody can see. So since words are that powerful mixed with emotion, here's what's important. Next line, learn to measure your emotions. Because if you don't do that, you can do more damage than good. Words not only give life, words kill. With words, you can kill someone's incentive. You can kill someone's dignity. You can either give life or take life by the words you use. So you've got to be very careful now with this emotional power. You've got to use it very wisely. Well-chosen words, yes. But now we need measured emotion and well-chosen words. But words loaded with emotion, it's so powerful, but you've got to measure it. Too much firepower destroys the opportunity. We say we don't shoot a cannon at a rabbit. That's too much firepower. It's effective, but you've got no more rabbit. Right? <laughs> One of my colleagues years ago said, you should have been there, Jim Rohn. Listen to my talk. He said, I blew them all away. I said, oh, no, where are they now? You, you blew them all away? That's too much. We don't, you don't need to blow everybody away. We're talking now about being effective. Here's the key, enough emotion. Now, the men have to work on enough, and probably the, the female side has to work on a bit of restraint. The men, a bit more, enough, and the women, not too much. And we all have to measure that, whether it's in our business, whether it's in sales. Or whether it's speaking to a child, enough but not too much. Okay. Isn't this interesting stuff? Yeah. I mean, this, you can't believe what a little bit of course on this stuff will do in helping you to sense some things you didn't sense before, see some things you didn't see before, and pick up some signals you never picked up before by just paying attention. Now your effectiveness multiplies by two, by three, by five, by ten. It's, it's fabulous. This is fabulous stuff. Okay. Now, what is the intensity? It's the blend of all your emotions and all your experiences that have affected you. The key is to keep and store those so that they're handy and near the surface. Because here's the next key now in making a presentation, having a conversation. Number one, identification. If you have available to you all of your experiences close at hand, now you can identify with someone. Here's what identification means means making yourself real to someone else, hopefully in the very beginning. 
If a man talks to a man, that's a pretty easy identification. If a man talks to a woman, a lot more difficult. If we're the same, if we're sort of the same, it's a lot easier to identify. Here's what identification means, building a bridge between you and someone else by relating some common experiences. You start with that. But now how does a, an adult 40 relate to a child of 12? That's a long bridge from 40 to 12. How would you do that to get a child's attention? How would you do that to build a bridge so you could have a, a good conversation? Here's one of the keys. Remember when you were 12. Now, they can't remember 40, but you can remember 12. I remember almost every day of being 12. One challenge of being 12, you're not 13. <laughs> right? The teenager off going somewhere saying, oh, you can't come. You're only 12. Only 12. If I heard that once, I heard it 100 times. You're only 12. I couldn't wait to get out of 12. I seemed to be stuck in 12. If you're not a teenager, not, maybe that's changed now. But I mean, back then, I'm telling you, 12 was an <laughs> unbelievably tough year. Close, but not close enough. So you got to identify. So I remember when I was 12. So really? Sure. Did you ever get chosen last in school? They're choosing up teams, and I'll take you, I'll take you. You're standing there. The leader says, I'll take you, I'll take you, and you're standing there. Finally, you're the only one left. The next leader says, I guess I'll have to take you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can tell you about disappointments, right? I remember 12. I remember 12. So you just got to go back and see if you can't pick up the threads of your own experience so that you can now relate to somebody that's 12, a teenager. Man and woman, totally opposite. But if I've been lost and you've ever been lost, if we talked about that, I'll bet that would identify. Have you ever been lost? And, and she says, yeah, I, I remember being lost. And I, says, I remember when I was lost. Now we've got something in common. We're opposites in terms of sex, but now we've got an experience that's in common that helps to build a bridge. If I've got children and you've got children, even though I'm a father and you're a mother, but at least if we have children, we have something in common. Little things you can think of that helps to build a bridge fairly quickly between you and someone so that you have a better chance now to communicate well. We call this simply identification. Next. Key to good communication is learn to attack the problem but not the person. This is an art. Too often we attack the person that is so closely identified with the problem that the key is to attack the problem. We expect the doctor not to attack the patient, but we expect the doctor to attack the disease, to attack the problem, to make the operation successful, save the patient, Destroy the disease, destroy the diseased organ. So here's what we expect a doctor to be, very professional. So you can't be reckless here now going after the problem when it seems like you're going after the person. You've got to be like a surgeon. This is important stuff here because a lot of people really get destroyed here by not being careful like a surgeon. Matters of the heart are delicate. You can't operate on the heart with a hatchet. If you were about to go under for the heart operation and you heard the doctor say, hand me the hatchet, you'd come awake. You'd say, no, what do you mean? We're talking about my heart here. No, and some people go after matters of the heart with a hatchet. Right? Too severe. They're not careful enough to handle the problem, to go after the problem. But the key is to save the patient. And this is why you have to use this language even with your children. I love you, but I hate what's happening. I don't hate you. God sometimes has this difficulty. Saying, I love you, but I hate your sinful ways. Now, since me and my sinful ways are so sort of wrapped up together, I have a tendency to think, well, maybe God hates me. And God says, no, let me make it clear one more time. I don't hate you. I love you, but I hate what's happening. Your sinful ways that are carrying you away, your sinful ways that are leading you to destruction, your sinful ways that will soon have you dead. That's what I hate, right? The sinful ways that's got their fingers around your throat, shutting off the air supply. That's what I hate. I hate the enemy, not you. I hate the enemy. And if you learn to deal with your kids that way, they'll appreciate what you hate as long as they know what you love and what you hate. And sometimes you just got to say it. You got to make it clear. I don't hate you but I hate what's going on. I hate what I see. I hate what's happening. I don't feel good about it. I feel good about you, but not about it. 
See, if you make it clear, that kind of communication is so useful. It is so powerful. Now, here's one of the best ways to attack a problem, and that's to confess you've got it or that you've had it. Say, Mary, the reason I'm talking to you about this is I'm telling you I've been through it, and I made some wrong decisions, and let, let me tell you what it carved out of my life that I'll never get back. One of the best illustrations is to use yourself. Say, John, I want you out of this ditch because I remember when I was in the ditch and stayed a little too long. You can't imagine what it cost me to keep putting off the decision, keep putting off the decision. I'm telling you, I've got some regret, a little bit regret till this day. Don't let that happen to you. Use yourself. One of the best illustrations is yourself. If you're getting on somebody's case, say, hey, I remember somebody got on my case and saved the day. If that person hadn't come along, got on my case, told it like it was, give it to me straight, I'm telling you, I'd have been lost, I'd have been gone, wouldn't be here to talk to you. So listen to me from my own experience. See, that kind of communication is so valuable. Now, here's another way to attack a problem. Use an illustration of a person that isn't there. So let me tell you about John, Joe. John said, oh, well, oh, well, sure enough. I'm telling you, he regrets to this day his oh well attitude. And if John was here, he'd tell you himself. But since he isn't here, let me tell you about John. If John was here, he would plead with you with tears in his eyes. See, that third party, first you confess your own sins, the mistakes you made, what you went through to help someone. Then you use an, a third party, another illustration for someone that isn't there, instead of direct. Then when there's no hope left, you can use the direct attack. Here's what we call this, tools of last resort. They are useful, but you've got to be very careful using tools of last resort. Here's the first one, a direct attack, you. No illustration, no third party, you. See, you got, now you've got to be very careful when you go direct. Because now confrontation is always... It's, it's difficult. It can be so helpful. It can save the day. It can rescue somebody from disaster. But it is, you've got to know what you're doing when you go for the direct attack. Because now you may destroy your chances forever to get back into a conversation with a person if you destroy it this time. You've got to do it. You've got to do it strong. And you've got to do the direct attack. But you've got to do it in such a way that the door is still open in this communication effort. A direct attack. Here's another tool of last resort, scolding. You've got to be very careful of scolding. It may be necessary, but only as a tool of last resort. It's not something you use up front. Use yourself as an illustration. You know, confess yourself and for someone else. Then if there's no hope left, then you go for the direct attack. And the same way with scolding. You've got to be very careful. Somebody walks in late and you say, where have you been? See, that's loaded. That's loaded with insinuation. And yes, finally it might be time to use it. Finally there isn't any other way, and you've got to resort to it. But you've got to be careful of these tools of last resort. Don't use them up front. Only use them as a last resort. Because when you say, where have you been? See, that insinuates all kinds of things. You don't care. Insinuation, if it's necessary, is important. But if it isn't necessary, it's important to leave it out. Old Joe Kennedy taught John Kennedy who became president, one important phrase. Here it is, and it applies in so many ways, so jot it down. If it is not necessary to change, it is necessary not to change. If it is not necessary to use strong language, it's necessary not to use strong language. If it's not necessary to scold, then it's necessary not to scold. You can't just use it because you're good at it. Or just because, you know, something flared up and you just let it fly. You can only use it because it's absolutely necessary. And if it is not necessary to scold, it is necessary not to scold. Tools of last resort. Some parents scold their children all day long. Scolding is like getting someone's attention with a cut. And yes, it'll heal. With a cut. And yes, it'll heal. And yes, maybe this time it was necessary to scold. But what if you did that all day? Every day, all day. You can imagine these children that have these psychic scars for the rest of their life because they've been attacked all day with words. 
clipped and cut. And some of them heal and some of them never heal. Why? Too often, too daily, too consistently. Let's go. So you've got to save up this for, for an occasion that really demands it. Some things are too severe. In some countries, if you steal, they cut off your hand. We would call that too severe. A little piece of the finger, maybe, but, you know, not the whole, not the whole hand. Come on. But it is effective. I said, did you ever steal anything else? Guess it's with one hand. No. So, is this coming through? Yeah. This communication stuff, I'm telling you, it's so valuable. So, scolding, save it up, save it up as a tool of last resort when it's now really necessary. And then, be careful. Next is sarcasm. There's a place for sarcasm. Who do you think you are? But see, you wouldn't use that up front. You wouldn't use it every day. You wouldn't use it very often. Now, there is a time to use it, but sarcasm, you've got to be careful. A lot of things concerning human relations, you've got to be careful. Here's one of the most important. Husband and wife have to be careful. Teasing. You've got to be very careful. Because with teasing, it's too easy to cross the line to where teasing becomes cruelty. Yes, it's kind of fun, but it, it is so easy to tip. It's so easy for teasing to tip. Even with children, you've got to be careful teasing children. Children have to be careful teasing each other. Why? Because it's so easy to tip it just a little too far, and it's the beginning of cruelty. Not You say, well, we call it teasing. You say, no, some of it's the beginning of cruelty. Not ultimate cruelty, not devastating cruelty, but it could lead to that. So you've got to be very careful. The human heart is very fragile. No matter how strong and powerful and loud the exterior may be, I'm telling you, that ain't true of what's going on inside. Everybody's consciousness and dignity and heart is a delicate matter. And you can do so many useful things and you can have such an unbelievable success if you just follow a few of these little guidelines, especially on tools of last resort. Save it up. It's like profanity. The key is to save it up. You know, if a guy swears and cusses all day, say, oh, don't mind John, he's just a cusser, right? I mean, you know, we have to put up with his mouth all the time. But see, that's ineffective. But somebody that doesn't use profanity, I'm telling you, the day they do, the world stops. <laughs> Bill doesn't usually talk like that. I mean, you know, something must be going on. So what you, you save it. You save it. Then when you use it, it's so effective, but not every day. A mother screams every day. Finally, the kids just get used to it. Other kids come over to visit, and they say, don't mind Mama, she's just a screamer. You know, she just uh, screams all day long. But see, one day it might be fatal. The little three-year-old is headed for the street, and the truck is coming. Mama screams. Doesn't mean anything, because she's been screaming every day all day. See, if she would have saved up her screams when the three-year-old is headed for the street and she screams, the world stops. Everybody's blood turns to ice water. Wow. Mama doesn't scream that often. But when she does, it means something. What's the old story? Cry wolf, right? Too often. Just save it. Okay. So, with care... You can help so many people if you do it with care. Careful communication. Powerful, yes, but careful, yes. I don't mind a minister consigning my soul to hell fire for my sinful ways. I don't mind that as long as he does it with tears and not with joy. <laughs> if you're going to preach a message on hell fire, you've got to sob and cry all your way through. You can't preach a dry-eyed sermon on sending people to hell. We would all dismiss it as an ego performance, a dry-eyed sermon on hellfire. You've got to sob. Your heart's got to break. And the tears have to flow if you're going to preach hellfire. Otherwise, it's an ego performance. We would all dismiss it. Ineffective. Some conversations you have with your children, the tears have to flow. Otherwise, the conversation doesn't make sense. 
if your heart doesn't break and the tears don't flow. So a dry-eyed conversation with a child in some matters, it doesn't make sense. So see if you can't stir that emotion when you get ready for one of those that's absolutely necessary, when the tears have to flow and the heart has to break. Key. Next, on communication. The power of persuasion. Let's talk about that. We can present, but the, here's what the ultimate goal is in communication, is to persuade, not just to present. Two great orators of antiquity. One was Demosthenes, the other one was Cicero. When Cicero spoke, everybody said, what a great speech. When Demosthenes spoke, everybody said, let us march. One was a presenter and the other was a persuader. So what's the difference in presentation and persuasion? Let me give you just a few tips. Here's number one. Become a good storyteller. One of the great ways to persuade is to illustrate with a story, a story, a story. Young Schuler gave his sermon, used a fantastic story. He was, I guess, preaching for his father, Dr. Schuler, who was off, I think, on vacation. So Young Schuler's given a sermon, one of the classic sermons. Let me give you the three points. Three points. This is one of the classic sermons I ever heard of all time. Point number one. If you think it's impossible, it isn't. Good point. Point number two, if you think you know everything, you don't. Good. Number three, if you think you're alone, you're not. And his illustration for if you think it's impossible, it isn't. He said Rich DeVos needed a heart transplant, the founder of Amway. Otherwise, he's not going to make it. To shorten the story, Rich DeVos gets his heart transplant. He's now got a new heart. But here's the stunning part of the story. After his heart transplant, and not long ago, he has lunch with the lady who gave him her heart. Rest that on your mind. You say what? Impossible. You can't have lunch with the person who gives you their heart. Well, maybe not 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but today, this lady needed a liver transplant. I think it was liver transplant. And sometimes when they transplant the liver, it's best for the heart and the liver to go together. So someone dies, donates their organs, and this lady gets the transplant of the liver and the heart. Now her heart is left over. And so this heart, left over, goes to Rich DeVos. That's how he was able to have lunch with the woman who gives him her heart. Isn't that a great story? So, fabulous. So here's what I'm asking you to be. Just underline it. Be a good storyteller. Pick up all the stories. Herbalife Corporation, I do a lot of things for them around the world. They got the story of this lady, uh, a Spanish lady down in Miami who started the business with $1 17 years ago. And now she's a millionaire, does business in many countries, lives in a beautiful home, drives a big white Jaguar. And when she started with a dollar, she was a single mother with two children, ill, in the hospital, no job. Now, when she tells her story, guess how she finishes it? If I can do it, what? Surely you could do it. One dollar? That's all I had. So she couldn't buy and sell. She had to sell and buy. If you just learn the stories, whether it's a story for a child, you got to have kids' stories. You're talking to teenagers, you got to have some teenage stories. Don't be lazy now in gathering these stories because they're so valuable in illustrating a point. I use the story, the Girl Scout story. I mean, a lot of you, right, have heard my Girl Scout story? Unbelievable. I'm really, this is before I met Mr. Schoff, turned my life around. I hear a knock on my door. I go to the door. There's this little Girl Scout selling cookies. And she said, for the Girl Scouts, the cookies, only $2, greatest organization in the world. She gave me this unbelievable presentation. And said, it's only $2. No problem, I wanted to buy. Big problem, I didn't have $2. 
And I didn't want to tell her that. So I did what I thought was next best. I lied. <laughs> and I said, look, I've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. We've still got plenty stacked in the house that we haven't used yet. Right? Might as well make it a good lie. Right. So, she said, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And she leaves. When she leaves, I say to myself, I don't want to live like this anymore. I mean, how low can you get lying to a Girl Scout? <laughs> and shortly after that, I met my mentor who turned my life around. And maybe it took me, right, finally reaching that low point in my life, lying to the Girl Scout. And I said, never again. So I promised myself I would always carry lots of money. If there's any Girl Scouts here, I am prepared. I got the cash. After that, I'm walking out of the bank one day in uh, uh, Saratoga, where I lived in Saratoga. I walk out of the bank one day, two little girls selling candy right outside the bank, right? Good place. I come walking out of the bank. Little girl says, Mr., would you like to buy some candy for the worthy cause? I said, uh, what kind is it? She said, it's almond mocha. I said, my gosh, that's my favorite. She said, oh, wonderful. And I looked at her and I said, how many boxes of that candy have you got? And she said, I've got... Uh, Five, I think it was. Uh, and I, the other little girl, she was selling candy too. I said, how many boxes have you got? She said, well, I got four. I said, that's nine. I'll take them all. They said, really? <laughs> I said, sure, I've got some friends, right? And I'll pass them around. I give them the money. I got the candy. And the first little girl looks up at me and she says, mister, you are really something. <laughs> how about that? From that experience before, when I didn't have the $2, now how things have changed in my life. So, stories. Have you underlined that now? Stories, personal stories. You know, search around in your own life and say, here's a story I haven't told for a long time, or here's a story that, you know, I never could tell because it, when it happened, it was too fresh and too severe, but now I think I can tell that story. That's true. Some things, when they happen to you, just now, some of them are beginning to speak about the Holocaust. Why? Because that first 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it was so unspeakable and it was so horrible. They couldn't talk about it, couldn't talk about it. Now they're afraid everybody's going to forget and they're going to forget. So now they're starting to tell, tell, tell the story. So dig around in your life and see if there aren't some personal stories. And then some testimonials that you've heard. Like the Lydia testimonials, like starting with one dollar, now a millionaire. There's, a, there's thousands of those stories probably all around you. Don't be lazy in gathering up these stories so that when you're talking to a child, you got the, the stories. You talk to a teenager, you got the stories. When you talk to a woman, you got the stories. When you talk to a homemaker, you got the stories. No matter who you're talking to, you, you got stories. You got ways and means to illustrate your point. That's number one. Be a good storyteller. Here's number two. Accurate facts. If you're going to communicate, speak the truth. There's nothing more powerful than the truth. It sets everything free. It sets you free to give a strong testimonial, the truth. Especially in business, here's what you don't need, exaggerations. But it's unimportant. Exaggeration. You say, well, I got to pad the number so it'll seem right. You say, no. Something will give you away in your voice. Somebody also pick up those signals and say, those numbers don't sound right. Better to speak the truth. Better understated than overstated. I've got this book called Seasons of Life. Someone says, well, that's not the best picture of you in there. I said, that's right, so that when I show up, I'll look better than the picture. <laughs> Some people use these glamour shots, right? And then when they show up, they look a little rough around the edges. Right? <laughs> Here's the important thing in business. Make sure it turns out to be easier than you said and more than you promised. Easier than you said and more than you promised. Exaggeration is the childish attempt to make up for lack of self-worth and self-confidence. There's nothing better than the truth. If the right numbers, if the right numbers don't do it, you just don't do it. But the right numbers will strike a key with enough people to where the response will be plenty to support you. Next, and in my profession and others, it's, it's more important, but a little oratory saying something extremely well. And now I use quotes to help say something extremely well. If you can't think of a way to say it, you know, borrow a, a quote from someone. Churchill said, the truth is incontrovertible. 
Malice may attack it and ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. See, that's well said. Just borrow that because you could stay up all night and not think of that. <laughs> right? No matter how hard you tried. So you just borrow a little Churchill. Why not borrow it? It is so well said. I borrow the lyrics from a song, right? Barbara Streisand sings, it used to be so natural to talk about forever, but used to be's don't count anymore. They just lay on the floor till we sweep them away. You don't sing me love songs. You don't say you need me. You don't bring me flowers anymore. See, if you can't say it better than the lyrics, then borrow the lyrics. Use the lyrics. Elton John sings, she lived her life like a candle in the wind never knowing who to cling to when the rains set in. See, it's hard to say it much better than that, how brief and fragile life really is. George Harrison sings, If not for you, the winter would hold no spring. Couldn't hear a robin sing. I just wouldn't have a clue if not for you. That's big-time stuff, right? I mean, sure, you could coin some stuff, and if you coin some stuff, use it. But, boy, it's, it's so easy to borrow, so easy to borrow, and it's just as effective to borrow. You don't have to claim it for your own. Just borrow it and say, I got this from someone. Zig is so much fun to borrow from. <laughs> Zig says money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. <laughs> See how, <laughs> Zig, you're right. <laughs> Zig is so cool, I mean... He's good. Zig says, my dentist told me, Zig, only floss the teeth you want to keep. I mean, you know, forget the rest. <laughs> Here's one Zig is famous for around the world. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want if you're interested. Some people aren't interested. If you're interested. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Serve the public. You're entitled to the wealth. Zig is so good. So quotes, borrow, make your conversation alive. If you can remember stories and remember the quotes, little one-liners, whatever they are, it doesn't matter. One I'm famous for around the world is what? Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work hard on your job, make a living. Work hard on yourself, make a fortune. I used to hope things would change. Here's what my mentor taught me. For things to change, Mr. Rohn, you have to change. For things to get better, you have to get better. So well said in a couple of sentences, a whole body of philosophy in a couple of sentences, enough to feast on forever. Now, here's another part of persuasion, and that's straight talk. Just make the note, everybody's interested in this, tell it like it is, tell it like it really is is this is why the truth sets free because it tells it like it is now you can correct the problem now you can set up new disciplines without the truth you're helpless we got to tell the truth we got to give it to them straight we got to tell the kids straight here's the deal now here's another one and that's challenge part of persuasion is a challenge all of us respond to challenge and a big challenge is you go do it, you go do it. Why don't you do it? You can do it. Here's a better challenge. Let's do it. Let's climb the mountain. Let's build a business. Let's start and get going. Let's become healthy. Not you go exercise. Let's exercise. Let's go to the gym. Let's jog around the block. Let's change our diet and see how healthy we can become. Let's, let's, let's. There's nothing more powerful than let's. Here's why. An ancient script says this. If two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing is impossible. Try that on for size. All of my enterprises for the last 40 years have been partnerships. Two, three, four people. Two, three, four. Why? Because it's so powerful. You say, well, isn't partnership tricky? Say, yes, it's tricky, but it's powerful. It's like marriage. It's tricky, but it's powerful. There's nothing like it. Having children, isn't that a little tricky? Say, yes, but... You've got to go for it. You've got to try the experience. Having a child is like a throw of the genetic dice. And you have no idea what's coming up. How many previous generations in the throw? Who knows how many generations? But you, 
you got to you got to play the game <laughs> to see what see if you can manage it see if you can handle it see if you can turn what is into what you wish to be see if you can't influence and speak and use yourself as an influence over whatever happens and see if you can make something unique out of it sure it's a challenge sure it's a win or lose but what else is new sure the, the possibilities but the odds are in your favor. Let's go do it. Old Testament says, one person becomes so powerful they can put a thousand to flight. If two get together, they can put 10,000 to flight. Here's what that suggests. Two getting together multiplies the power by 10, not by two. Why not try that? Why not take a gamble and see if it might not work for you? Get somebody and say, hey, let's go, let's go. Two of us and three of us, and nobody's a match for three of us. That's powerful stuff. Yes, it's tricky. Yes, it's part of the dynamics of, you know, the mysteries of life. And who knows? Who knows? But who knows when it'll work? That's how we build cities, and that's how we conquer disease, and, and that's how we build universities, and that's how we build enterprise, and that's how we affect the world, two or three. How many pilgrims were there? It wasn't a million. How many did the little boat hold? Not very many, but they started something that has startled the world, the pilgrims. Not a million, just a handful set out, crossed the ocean. Let's see what we can do, build a new country. Those dynamics are so powerful, they're irresistible. When somebody gathers you up and says, come on, let's go, because you can't think of everything to be inspired. When somebody comes, let's go, let's try it, let's do it, let's do it, here we go. See, that is, that is so powerful that when the invitation is given, if it's the right invitation, you got to go. Or you put it together. Pick this one, pick this one, and say, let's go. Just two or three. How many disciples were there? Not 12,000. How many? 12. Just, just 12. Just 12. Just two or three, just five or six, just a few can turn the world upside down, do extraordinary things. So remember this challenge, the we, let's go do it. The great prayer is a collective prayer. It doesn't say my father who's in heaven. No, it doesn't say that. It says what? Our father. Every time you pray, you might pray as an individual, but you pray collectively for the collective. Our father, our family's father, our community's father, our country's father. Pray individually, yes, but pray the hour because it's, the, it's all of us that's, that's powerful. Each of us need all of us. All of us need each of us. Who's a match for all of us? <laughs> Nobody. Who's a match for one of us? Everybody. But all of us? Give me my daily bread. No, no. Yes, you pray it individually, but it's inclusive. Give us. Lead us around temptations. Deliver us. Individually prayed, but collectively thought about. Deliver us, the family. Deliver us, the community. Deliver us, the organization. Here's the last part on communication, especially in the art of persuasion, and that's a passionate belief in something. And your passionate belief in something doesn't have to be something you talk about all the time. For some, it's religion. It's a unique experience. It's spiritual. For some, it, it is an objective. It is a, a vocation. But the greatest passion to start with is to be extremely successful and affect as many people as you can. That's, that's the quickest and easiest passion to uncover. And you don't have to wait till you find your passion. Just... Be passionate about being healthy. Be passionate about being influential. Be passionate about being extremely successful. Sinatra said, the greatest revenge is massive success. <laughs> Be passionate about winning. You know, the game of financial independence, power, parenting, the best. Success is that early passion to succeed in making progress, to succeed in getting healthy, to succeed in learning skills, to succeed in, 
in being better this year than you were last year, to succeed in expanding your horizons, to succeed. That's the early passion. Now, if you find something in particular like being a sculptor, you know, learning sculpturing or painting or whatever, and then that becomes, you know, a, a passionate affair with you, uh, that's fine. But the early passion can be just very simple A, B, C stuff, overcoming fears that you've had, you know, being a more confident person, right? Self-esteem at the highest possible level, you know, that kind of passion to be an articulate person, to be able to persuade, to be able to share my story, to be able to affect other people in a positive way, my community, you know, that's the passion to take whatever you've got and turn it into a successful, prospering, flourishing, exciting, financial, social, personal, spiritual life, right? That's the passion, to be all that you can possibly be. That was Mr. Schoff's philosophy. I said, how much should I earn? He said, as much as you can. How far should I go? As far as you can. How many books should I read? As many as you can. How much should I share? As much as you can. How many things should I try to go see? As many things as you possibly can. Stretch as far as you can, go as far as you can, earn as much as you can, do as much as you can. Become as successful as you possibly can. Be the best parent you possibly can be. That was enough passion for me. In fact, it had so many unique categories that it's kept me busy all these years. Just trying to stretch to that degree. A passionate belief, a passionate persuasion about life. For some people, it is a spiritual experience, and they don't necessarily talk about it all the time, but they use it as fuel for the fire. It makes them unusual. It gives them charisma. It gives them an unusual presence. Not something they speak about all the time, but something that happens to them all the time. If you've ever been rescued, somebody saved your life, I'm sure that would be an experience that would linger and fuel the fire for how long? Probably forever. Someone saved your life. That's, you just, then you just use that experience. You don't necessarily talk about it all the time. You just use it. You know, I got a second chance at life. I mean, it could have been over for me. I got this second chance. Now that I got this second chance, I'm going to make it everything I can possibly make it. And those fires burn, right? You use it. You use it. And whether it's religion or whether it's spiritual or whether it's a personal or whether it's social, whatever it is, just, just use that to become a a great persuader. The greatest, in my opinion, of the apostles was the the great persuader. He found himself in a prison one day, the king's prison, Agrippa. And Agrippa said, you know, I've heard about this unusual man that's head of the Christian movement. Bring him to me. And they said, yes, he's in your jail. And Agrippa said, I got to meet the man. So they hauled him out of jail, out of the prison, and brought him to Agrippa. And Agrippa said, Paul, I've heard about you. What is this Christian thing? Unfortunately, you find yourself in my jail, but what's going on here? It's growing like a prairie fire. What's the deal? Well, he shouldn't have asked. (laughs) I mean, right fresh out of the prison, the apostle said, let me tell you my story, king. He said, I used to hate the Christians, killed everyone I could get my hands on. In fact, I had letters from your own government to kill every Christian I could find. And he said, one day I had some of these fresh letters in my hand, and I'm on my way to Damascus to kill more Christians. Agrippa said, wow. But he said, on this trip, this great light shined out of heaven, knocked me off my horse, ground my face in the dirt, and blinded me for three days. Good Lord, just wanting to get his attention. (laughs) And he said, from this unique experience, I became a Christian. Now they call me Paul. I was formerly known as Saul, the persecutor of the Christians. Now I'm Paul, the leader of the Christians. And he wove this whole story, and he made it so magical, and he made it so powerful, right? Right out from the prison to the presence of the king. When he finished this incredible classic presentation, you got to read it sometime because it's a classic. When he finished it, here's what the king said. He did send him back to prison, but here's what he said. You've almost persuaded me to be a Christian. The king. You can get so good at this, you can almost get the king. But that was that passion that he had. And here's what he said in the closing of his speech. Oh, king, I wish you had what I got, except for these chains. I don't wish the chains on you, but the change, not the chains. 
So, classic presentation, fueled with the fire of a passionate belief. But it doesn't have to be religion, though. It can be any experience or a collection of experiences that furnishes for you the fuel that, that puts that sparkle in your eye every day, that gives you this zest and appetite for life to where you can't wait to get up in the morning and you're reluctant to close your eyes at night. Wow, that kind of fire. It's very powerful. Find it. Put it together. This is the end of this disc. The program continues on the next CD.